Welcome back to the Narrative Monopoly podcast. On today's episode, we have Mike Maples. Mike is one of the best investors in Silicon Valley, and he is known for many of his popularized concepts, such as the Thunder Lizard and backcasting, um, just a wealth of knowledge on creating companies. But today, we actually get some of his views about society at large. And I have to say, he left me feeling optimistic. He is a relentless optimist. If you want to find some more of his entrepreneurial content, definitely check out his podcast, Starting Greatness, where he interviews founders and executives and unlocks a lot of the knowledge on how to start companies and be great. Uh, But I think that we get him off of his stump speech a little bit today, and it is one that you are not going to want to miss. So without further ado, let's press play. All right, on today's podcast, we have Mike Maples. Mike is the co-founding partner at Floodgate, a venture firm in the Bay Area. Some of Mike's investments include Twitter, Twitch.tv, Lyft, Clover Health, Okta, and Chegg, among many others. Before founding Floodgate, Mike was founder and operating executive at back-to-back startup IPOs, including Tivial Systems and Motive. Mike is the host of the Starting Greatness podcast, which everyone should go subscribe to, which shares startup lessons from super performers. How are you, Mike? I can't complain. Thanks for having me on your show, Jeff. Oh, it's great to have you. Did, did I miss anything in the intro? Oh, yeah, I think you overdid it, probably. You're probably too nice to me. I don't know about that. Well, you you definitely took took the most time of any of the guests I've had so far to send me notes on what you want to talk about, which I really appreciate. And maybe on purpose, maybe not on purpose, but most of the stuff was just right in line with a lot of the recurring topics on this podcast. And so I want to dive right into that and talk about um, how you put it, which is the impact of an emerging decentralized network centric world as it displaces the centralized industrial world. Yes. Yeah. So should we just jump right into it? Let's jump right in. What do you mean by that? Okay. So, you know, it's funny when I, when I was, um, used to be an operator, my, my, my father was very successful in business. He ran products at Microsoft when I was young. And, um, I used to ask him, what is a better type of way to organize centralized or decentralized? And he would say, yes. And I'd say, well, what do you mean by that? And he used to call it the accordion. And his, his argument was that there is no absolute right answer to that question, that every, every decision like that has trade-offs. And so if you have a centralized organization, some things are going to work better and more efficient. Some things are going to not be as efficient. And if you have a decentralized organization, the same is true. And so what he used to believe is that there's an ebb and flow of centralization and decentralization. It's like one isn't absolutely good. One isn't absolutely bad. It's like one outlives its usefulness and then needs to be replaced by a swing of the, it's more like a pendulum and the average is central, but like it it swings both ways. And and by the way, this isn't just in recent times, right? So in uh, back in the day, we had the Reformation, right? And, And in the Reformation, we had a very centralized society controlled primarily by the Pope. If the Pope excommunicated you, you're host, right? That's it even if you're a successful business person, politician, whatever. But then the Reformation had two things happen that are remarkably similar to what feels about today. They had the printing press, and most people know about that. But then they also had double entry accounting, which sounds... And so when I think about today, you have the internet and crypto, uh, they sound remarkably similar. And the printing press and the double entry accounting had the effect of decentralizing because uh, the printing press allowed more people to be able to read, more people to be educated. It allowed people like Martin Luther to declare that some of the elites were illegitimate. And then similarly, double entry accounting allowed the Italian merchants to transact with each other in a decentralized way without having central authority oversight, because now I can can do debits and credits and we can settle our accounts together uh, at the edge. 
And so it had a dramatic effect on, on history and, and decentralizing. Well, okay, now let's think about where we are today. In the mid 1800s, you had uh, centralized technology of production reemerge. Uh, the railroad and the steam engine created a world where uh, mass production and mass distribution uh, gave people advantages to create economies of scale, which by the way, was a good thing, right? It was, it, it created abundance. It created uh, lower cost uh, devices and products for people. So overall it was a good thing. But I think probably if, if I were gonna handicap the time, I think probably sometime between the late fifties and early seventies, uh, peak centralization started to get to over rotate. And uh, now we have a new decentralized technology of production, mass computation, mass connectivity. And so like that animates my thinking about the world is the shift from the centralized technology of production uh, to the decentralized technology of production. What are, what are the implications on that for our, all of our big centralized, uh, big government, big military, big corporate uh, types of uh, institutions that I would argue are starting to be displaced. How do you think about how, you know, private enterprises and, and private individuals uh, forming social organizations, whether that's companies, whether that's a church, uh, w whatever that is, how do you view that within the framework of nation states and, and global governance? Because I think that what we're seeing now, you know, specifically uh, with 25% of the money supply being printed over the last year, these are macro effects that private actors cannot ignore. And so what I'm hearing from you, uh, at least what I'm taking from it, is that you have centralization and decentralization, but there's there's two different planes because there's decentralization in terms of, of companies and the way that society is organized. Uh, on a private level, but then on the public level, you, you mentioned like in the 70s, we, re we reached peak centralization. I think that that could be, I think w what I'm hearing is that is also uh, in the Taylorist model um, in terms of how manufacturing and, and the kind of the evolution of the assembly line, but then also Pax Americana and the, the global order and, and how we defeated the Soviet Union. So so is that kind of like how you view it is, is how those two planes operate or am I, am I way off base here? Well, well, let me just see if I can kind of talk about where, where, where I think things have led up to and where I think things might be going. And, and I try not to be very judgmental about it, right? I tend to think that, okay, things ebb and flow, right? Centralization, then decentral. It's like the accordion, like my dad used to say, right? And so, so like it, peak centralization, basically you had centralized technology of production and, and that was true in terms of companies, countries, and even currencies, which led up to ultimately led to fiat money. I mean, fiat money, what, what more of a term implies central? And so based on supply side economies of scale. And so how do decisions get made in such a world? The supply side decides. You have top-down leadership, right? Like Alfred Chandler wrote a great book called The Visible Hand. And so our economy used to operate on the invisible hand and um, the inv invisible hand is more of a decentralized way of voluntary interactions between people at the edge. The centralized visible hand started to manage and coordinate these really big institutions. You know, like in 1870, there was no accounting. There were no org charts, right? In 1820, there were no companies in America with more than 100 employees. You know, the biggest companies were like, spinning looms on the in Waltham, Massachusetts, right? And so the, the companies being big as we know them today or federal institutions being big as we know them today or the centralized press as we've experienced up until probably the last decade, th those are not common things. We think they're common because we're living in those times, but that's not how things normally were. If a person from 1820 showed up today, they would be shocked at how big some of these institutions are, right? So but, but what you see in that world is top-down leadership and credentialed elites as gatekeepers, and you have institutions that are too big to fail. And so what's happened, and this is where one of your prior guests, right, talked about the revolt of the republic. What happened is that the economy is now becoming animated by mass computation, mass connectivity. 
So now rather than the center deciding, the network decides. And so you have um, decentralized computation and connectivity. You also have decentralized money with cryptocurrency. So it's like we've gone from the, the River Rouge plant in Ford, which was this massive plant, to personal 3D printing. You know, we've gone from manipulating uh, raw materials at large scale to manipulating bits at micro scale. And we've gone from the visible hand of central elites telling us how to think and coming at us to networks saying, we have more information and agility to decide what the right answer is. You know, they're starting to believe that some of these central figures are illegitimate. And, and that's kind of what a lot of this is about, right? It's not just, it's, it, it's not just a cultural thing. It's sort of like in a supply side world that we came out of, the center decides in a demand side world, the network decides. And, and you know, events over and over again, because this is happening, tend to, um, they, they tend to emphasize and expose the incompetence of some of the elites who inherited these 20th century institutions rather than invented these institutions that are, we believe are gonna be successful in the 21st century. So, um, and, and I think we're gonna see this over and over again. And I'm not saying by the way that those people are stupid or that they're wrong or unethical. Some might be, but some are in all kinds of parts of our society. It's just that they, the tide of history has shifted uh, towards these decentralized platforms and approaches to how to organize society and our money and our, uh, how we protect rights of people. And it's just inevitable. It's, it's, not, it's not a good or bad thing in my view, it's a fact. It's like, it's like trying to deny gravity to suggest that it's not happening. Well, I love taking the broader view of history and, and zooming out and realizing that, you know, your immediate world, our immediate world is not necessarily indicative of all of human history and human nature. I mean, humans have been around uh, on the earth for 200,000 years and civilization is only 6,000 years old. Uh, and so it, it's not like we have a huge data set to, to come from. There's a show I, I just watched on Netflix called Turn and it's about the, have you seen it? It's, no, it, it's, it's a great show. Uh, it's about Washington putting together the first spy network during the Revolutionary War. Now, it's actually uh, incredibly historically accurate for relative to entertainment. But there is a segment in there where you see actually multiple segments where you see the characters bartering for different currencies because the currency issued by the Congress wasn't worth anything. They wanted pounds. They wanted silver. And so to your point, the fiat world that we live in is actually uh, not the norm of, of humanity. And I think that that's what we're just starting to wake up from. Now, you actually deploy capital on these ideas, right? So you have talked a lot about Metcalf's Law, which I would like you to explain for the listeners. And I know that you, know, you turned me on to the book, Wealth of Networks, which was written in 2004 or five, I believe. And just yeah. like Martin Gurry's book, it's, it's like it's sent from the future. It's crazy. Yeah. They, he now I know why you invested in Twitter before it was even Twitter, because that book basically explains Twitter before it even happens. So how, how much does this worldview shape your, your investing and, and actually putting capital work? And then could you give us a, a little overview of Metcalf's law? Yeah, very much so. So, you know, there are two, there are two fundamental laws that animate the magic of tech and what's happening today, right? There's Moore's law, which most people know about, right? It's the it's this idea that um, the, the cost of computing power basically gets cut in half every 18 months to two years. And that's been going on for a long time. But it's, 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 it's more abstract than that. It could be cost to sequence a genome or the, the cost for an accurate AI prediction. But, you know, the, cost, the technology improvement is exponential. And then you have uh, Metcalf's law, which basically said that the, the value of a network is a function of the square of its number of nodes. And so, for example, if, if I have Skype and I'm the only person in the world who has it, it's not worth anything, right? But now I say, hey, Jeff, uh, why don't you use Skype? We can make free calls. Now it's more valuable. Now let's say you take one of your buddies and say to, to him, hey, you and I can make calls. Well, now I can call you, I can call him, he can call you. And so what, what you see is that as the, as the number of nodes go up, interconnections between the nodes, 
increase at a geometric rate rather than a linear rate. And so those two laws, because they're both exponential, they have the, the chance to bring abundance to every man, woman, and child on the earth. Uh, and, and that's the way we need to be thinking about the future, I believe, right? And so, so as an investor, uh, I've, we've invested in two types of instantiations of this. One is pure play networks, you know, like Twitter, for example, uh, Twitch, it would be an example of that. But over time, I started to get increasingly convinced that uh, what, what I sometimes call network capitalism, sometimes call it cloud society, was going to not only create the opportunity for new pure play networks, but it would allow us to reimagine whole sectors of the economy. And so Lyft was a, a, was a version of that applied to uh, transportation. And so, you know, there is no way that a taxi company can successfully compete against the ride-sharing companies without having government protection because the, the leveraging mass computation, mass connectivity to share rides, to locate riders and drivers and to come up with a transaction price is just economically superior in every way. And so that got interesting to me. We're, we're working with a company called Ohm Connect that's applying some of the same ideas to saving energy and sustainability, but um, you know, I invested in a company called Origin that was acquired recently that creates uh, 3D printers. And to me, 3D printing, it's not just about 3D printing, it's about network manufacturing at the edge. Why, why build shoes in China that have a, a big carbon footprint just to ship them? Why not have a 3D printer right near the store and print shoes and reuse the materials and reprint them again someday? So, it, so they're all sort of different variations of this idea that um, software-defined networks are going to be the animating force of the economy, not big factories with big production and big distribution and advertise it on the TV industrial complex. What's interesting in that answer is, in a previous answer a few minutes ago, you know, you just talked about how things are shifting from supply side to demand side. And so with Lyft, the taxi industry is very much uh, would be the example of the supply side, and then Lyft would be an example of the demand side, uh, and so that definitely fits right into your your worldview. In terms of decentralizing, how does that fit into the basically? I, well, I'm going to steal the term of the book, but the wealth of networks that that is being created. How does that fit into decentralization? Because those are obviously related, but how do they how do they connect? Yeah, I think that um, the way they connect, in my view, is that, so first of all, um, I try not to be too political, I guess, but what I do believe is that if I'm objective about it, I think that, you know, big government has become increasingly less useful in its ability to execute. We saw the response to COVID, but we even saw like Obamacare, they couldn't roll out a website. Uh, or we see like it takes longer to build a bridge today than it did in 1915. Uh, and so we see a lot of things in our society where everything comes down to, you don't understand, it's more complicated than that. My hands are tied. It's not my fault, all this stuff. Well, what's happened, and I'll just give you a recent manifestation of this, because there's the decentralized tech of production. It applies not just to things that are produced, but where you live. And so the cloud has shown us that people who are talented and can build can live wherever they want. Well, so now um, if I don't like how San Francisco is being run, I can exit San Francisco and I can go to Miami. And so what, what I think we're seeing is a shift from, it's, it's actually an intellectual battle right now but I would argue that the conclusion is inevitable. We're seeing a shift in my view from big government to micro sovereignties. And Miami is a great example of a startup city where Mayor Suarez is acting like an entrepreneur. He's acting like a startup guy. And rather than say, it's too complicated, you wouldn't understand, you can't do that, you need my permission. He's saying, why not try? Why not try this? Why not uh, be ambitious? Why not be bold? Why not take risks? Even if we fail some of the time, why not? So he's becoming the place that says um, the default stance is going to be, let's figure it out. Let's try it. 
And so, you know, and that's often what happens you find is that centralization becomes very valuable for bringing abundance and efficiency for a while. But then because these institutions get so big, everyone has to ask permission to do anything. And so, you know, what part, part of what I love about this idea with permissionlessness in crypto is it's a metaphor writ large, right? Like networks and cloud culture allow a much more permissionless based way of governing, transacting, bringing abundance to the world rather than I have to ask the gatekeeper before I can do th things. I have to ask permission from the elite credentialed person who got a license before I can do anything. And so like, I think that this is playing out right now today is there's gonna be, you know, if you're the mayor of, or let's say you're the district attorney of San Francisco, you now compete with the district attorney in Miami. And it's like, you've never had to before. You could always say, hey, look, if you wanna be in Silicon Valley, you gotta be here, deal with it. You can't say that. Now, they don't realize this yet because they're not, they're too used to how they've done things, but that's what's happening right now. And we're, now we get to A-B test what systems work better, which ones don't. And I, as a customer of where I live, the government, local, whatever, I can take my talent business elsewhere. I can take my money business elsewhere from the dollar to Bitcoin. And so now all of a sudden there's micro sovereignties in the sense that people can come together in cloud cultures and come to a consensus about how they want to work together and how they want to get things done. I really like the idea of opting out. I, I think that that's going to be a, a huge trend. And, and I want to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, but before we get there, uh, to follow up on on that, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in Revolt of the Public, that that is a huge thing. Uh, you know, Martin shies away from making predictions about the future. But the one thing he says is if you're going to have a, a 21st century citizenry, then you're probably going to want a, a 21st century government. Uh, and so, you know, that has not adopted at all. And, and I, you know, one of my big ideas is that federalism is going to be the defining trend of the, the 2020s. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of exactly in line with what you're talking about. And I think the, the legal, the actual legal uh, opportunities there, I think are going to present really interesting, I don't want to use the term battle, but there's going to be really interesting arguments because, I mean, there's ambiguity in the Constitution around, uh, you know, the state power and, and the federal power. I mean, w when the country was founded, it was actually it ex actually existed with only nine states. And so you had four other states that weren't even uh, members of the federal government. And, and that's just kind of uh, almost mind blowing to think about or, or West Virginia, just breaking off from Virginia of, of their separate uh, in, in a separate convention. They did, that was that was permissionless. And, and so I think that there uh, there's going to be a, a very lively debate around federalism in, in both legal and um, technological realms in the, in the 2020s. Um, now I want to get a, uh, I want to, I want to sidestep here for a minute. You're from Austin, right? You're from Austin, well, I was Texas. From, yeah, I moved to California from Austin in uh, 2005. Are you going back? I need that. I need the the headline here. Uh, I don't, I don't have any plans to anytime soon. I mean, we might someday, but I you know I'm not in any hurry uh, to. I'm I'm more sort of interested in a broader. Disc so, roughly, I see two responses to the current times, and and I think it is a more important intellectual battle than people realize, and and this is probably the most important reason I wanted to come on your show, right? So, one response to the current times is sort of nihilistic, tear it all down. And I mean, people are literally tearing stuff down, right? Including statues, you've got wokeism and cancel culture. And this is the type of stuff that happens when you have a lack of vision and will at the top, right? You have politicians playing blame game, you know, and kind of printing money to create the illusion of fake growth in the failing parts of the economy. And by the way, it's not just it's not just the government doing this, you know, Fortune 500 spending $800 billion a year to buy back their own stock. So like abandoning all pretenses of wanting to build breakthroughs, right? They're taking their profit dollars to buy back stock rather than invest in future breakthroughs. And so the thing about the, the nihilism, tear it all down is like communism, there's a, there's a grain of truth, but now it's being exploited by people who are hungry to control others. And so, yes, we need more social justice, but 
replacing centralized elites with a woke mob is not a way to get it, right? Um, dumbing down standards at schools is not a way to get it. Uh, saying, hey, we don't want, um, we don't want to have the SAT test anymore because, you know, it makes us uncomfortable to face the reality of how some people score higher, some people don't. Uh, blame the billionaires, right? Rename schools rather than reopen them, right? So that's kind of the, the nihilistic approach. And it's, and it's an approach born in, born in making people who are uncomfortable feel a sense of learned helplessness. And so those people then assume uh, the, the beliefs of false leaders who really don't care about social justice at all. They just care about using it as a vehicle to exert power and to take reason out of the discussion, uh, just like the communists did, right? Just like the Marxists did. Um, the other alternative, I believe, is I haven't come up with a, the right term for it yet, but I would say it's time to build. And the you know it's Andreessen it's it's uh it's cryptocurrency rather than printing money to pretend things are okay it's it's uh saying no breakthroughs are possible and freedom is a good thing and technology is inspiring and the reason we're not all you know like advanced monkeys in the dirt throwing sticks at each other is we invented breakthrough after breakthrough and we had a shared stake in it you know. We used to decide in the early days of industrial revolution, we were going to have a transcontinental railroad. We used to decide that we were going to land on the moon. Uh, and now, um, because we have a bunch of people in our culture who are preaching this gospel of learned helplessness and how everybody else is bad and how that group's bad to your group, they're, they're, you know, we can destroy each other out of our cynicism or we can lift each other up out of shared purpose. And everyone in our society has a choice to make about which side of that they're on and which side of history they want to be on. Because the future doesn't happen to us. It happens because of us and the choices we make. And so like what I'm trying to do is help people. I'm trying to help Silicon Valley quit using dumb terms like disruptive or robots eating the jobs or artificial intelligence, weird sounding dystopian stuff. And what we instead need to do is help young people, especially dream the way the Wright brothers did and help them understand that these technologies harnessed properly can create breakthroughs that will give us all a shared purpose again. But I think ultimately, you know, it's like, don't tear it all down. It's time to build. It's time to embrace the idea of change. And it's time to have a, a lens of optimism and fear, or sorry, optimism about the future rather than a lens of fear about the future. And uh, the tech industry is not doing itself any favors by how it talks about the future. Uh, you know, we need, we need to talk about the future in a more positive, unapologetic, uh, this is good for all of humanity type of way and why that is rather than a bunch of, you know, non-empathetic terms that don't even get to what's happening for real. That was very well said. Uh, <laughs> that was, I mean, I mean to, to really paint the picture for, for folks and, and lay out the two choices of, of nihilism or progress, that is what's clear. Now, the nihilism piece, let's, let's uh, unpack both of those. The, the nihilism piece, it, what you really said at the start was that we're failing the marshmallow test uh, on one hand, right? So people are just living off this sugar high um, for today and, and, and screw tomorrow, um, you know, the good example of this is the federal debt, uh, which we can get into if you want, but it's completely unsustainable. Um, and, and it's absolutely a failure of the marshmallow test because, you know, it, it's like, okay, instead of uh, dealing with the pain of, of perhaps a, a small recession because of the pandemic, uh, well, hopefully small, instead, we're just going to issue $6 trillion in debt over 12 months. And now we have the highest debt to GDP ratio uh, in history in the history of the United States. And so on that front, it, it almost, it almost does make sense how people uh, would see the, the benefits of nihilism, right? If they don't see the other, other side of the coin. And that's a big thing that I focus on with this podcast and in, in my thinking is that we are a product of whatever information we consume. So I would throw it back to you on how do you get people to really see uh, the benefits of progress, because um, to me, they're obvious to you. They're obvious. 
Um, but, you know, we probably consume different information than people who uh, just to, to give them the benefit of the doubt, let, let's say for devil's advocate, uh, who, who just want to tear it all down. Um, how, how do you how would you fix that? You know, if you were philosopher king for the day, how, how do you fix this? Uh, well, you know, it, it's incredible to me, you know, like people, for example, have sort of polluted the word, word capitalism to mean uh, kind of whatever they want it to mean. You know, in my worldview, capitalism is a is a system that allows people to trade voluntarily um, with mutual consent, right? And um, and it represents free people and free markets. So, like, if 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 I lobby a politician for a law to be changed, I view that not as capitalism. I view that as crony capitalism. I view that as a perversion of capitalism. So, most of the complaints I hear about capitalism are of the variety of examples of it not really being practiced and blaming capitalism for that. So, so like, I, I just want to be clear about my terms, right? So Cornelius Vanderbilt died in the 1870s. He was the richest guy in the U.S. at the time. His wealth was 3% of the GDP of the United States. Uh, did he have a flushing toilet? No. Did he have running water? No. Did he have a light bulb or electricity? No. Did he have a car? No. So we've created so much abundance in the last 150 years or so, we've literally had to continuously redefine what it means to be poor. Like I've, I've heard some people say, man, I wish I'd had Cornelius Vanderbilt's money. But if you ask that person, okay, would you like to go back and live in the 1870s to have it? Most people would say no, even poor people. Right. And like, what does that say? So I look at that and I'm like, it's a miracle. Right. It's like it's like one of the greatest miracles in the history of humanity. You go look at a chart of GDP per capita. It was like a flat line for centuries at a time. And then it's like a light switch turned on and it just exploded. And like the number of people coming out of poverty even today is just extraordinary. Right. So. Yes, that we're going through dislocations, things are changing. Yes, uh, you know, like the ideas in Martin Gurry's book about like uh, the revolt against, you know, the revolt of the public. But to me, the real issue is that the action is increasingly at the edges rather than the center. And that the, the inherited elite institutions are no longer performing their function well uh, they've outlived their usefulness for the most part. And so the question is, do you want to build the new better thing on top of the new realities in the new world and the new rules, or do you just want to find someone to blame for it? And the people who are running the central inherited institutions of today don't know what to do, right? They, they, they like, you know, Balaji Srinivasan has a good term for this. They're not read-write people. They're read-only people. They're used to pushing the button so the machine keeps going, turn the crank so the machine keeps going. They're clueless about why people are hostile towards their leadership. Like they literally don't understand it. It doesn't compute in their world. But the problem is their institutions are just getting progressively less capable of ha handling the challenges. So then the question becomes, okay, do you want to just tear it all down? Or if you're a leader of these institutions, do you want to demagogue issues to distract attention from the failures and blame other games and print more money to uh, give free stuff to people so they don't pay attention? Or do you want to say, hey, we, we have everything we need to continue this path of extraordinary abundance and improvement and mass computation and mass connectivity can bring so much abundance to the world that someday we will have to continue to redefine what it means to be poor. Like someday, people who live in the late 21st century wouldn't want to go back to our time, even if it meant they could have been the richest person in our time. Like that's, that's what we need to get to as a society. And we need, we need leaders who have the courage and integrity and vision to describe what that better world could be like and why it's worth having a shared, a shared stake in achieving that world, just like we did with the transcontinental railroad, just like we did with landing on the moon. Right. And too many politicians of today would rather br blame someone than stick their neck out and give a speech like JFK did once and said, we're going to land on the moon.
because they feel like it's a sucker's game, that they'll get, they'll lose political capital. And to be honest, they lack confidence in their own ability to make it happen. And so, but we need more people like that, right, in the public sphere. Uh, we need more business people who don't just use their profit to buy back more stock. You know, we need, we need people that practice authentic journalism more than has been happening in recent times, unfortunately, right? We've got, a, and I'm sympathetic to all those people because the business model of all of their different institutions is not working like it once did. Quick uh, story on whether you would live as, as Cornelius Vanderbilt or not is I actually, I asked Jason Crawford in the second episode that same question. And he said, the way to answer it is, you ask someone, you know, if, if you could go back in time and live with this person's amount of wealth, like wh- or w- what is the price that you would pay? And if they wouldn't pay the price, then they're richer today than they are than Cornelius Vanderbilt was back then. Like that's the way to do it. And, you know, most people would not would not take that that sum uh, of his money. And I think uh, it is kind of crazy. Uh, America is probably the, the first place in the history of time where uh, we have an obesity problem. Uh, with a, a lot of people who are in poverty. Uh, that is not traditionally what you would describe as, as poverty, um, with what you're saying. Not to say that, that those lives aren't, uh, aren't, aren't uh, you know, optimized. But I, I, to me, I, I feel like the trend that you're describing almost is uh, a failure uh, culturally. Because when you talk about JFK's confidence in, in sending us to the moon, um, you talk about how the Wright brothers, they didn't ask permission. They just went to the beach and, and, and discovered flight for the first time. Uh, and now all of a sudden, if you're anyone on, on planet Earth, you basically can get to any point on, on planet Earth within 24 hours, which is just insane <laughs> when you think about it. So how much does culture play a role in this? Yeah, although, you know, the other thing that's disheartening about that, the the example of flight, is the time from Wright Brothers to the Concorde is the same amount of time from the Concorde being invented to today. And if you track the improvement in flight from Wright Brothers to the Concorde, I would assert that it's a little bit of a greater accelerating rate than the Concorde of today. In fact, we don't even have the Concorde anymore. It's worse today. (laughs) And so, so imagine if JFK when the Russians are like beating us in space, if he's, if, if pe- people just went around saying, well, you know what, I guess communism is just better. I mean, after all, they can even launch rockets into outer space. You know what? I guess, you know, it's time for us to just acknowledge the communism is better. And uh, let's, let's just cave into that. But JFK says, no, we are going to be the first on the moon. And what it's going to show is, more than just we prove we could land on the moon, it, it, it showed the stakes for humanity about which system was more forward thinking, uh, more um, industrious. It showed that a free culture could produce the outcomes that a communist culture could not. That's the kind of conversations we need to be having today, right? Rather than who's to blame for everything, we need leaders who say no, we, the people of this country or in the Western world, need to get our mojo back and have like visions and goals. You know, this is why people are inspired by Elon Musk, right? Because he's the, he does the seemingly impossible and he's sort of this ray of light in a sea of skeptics. He's sort of a, a person who takes matters into his own hands and people say, you're crazy. He says, watch me. Uh, and so, but we need more people like that. We need to celebrate people more like, rather than call him a policy failure or some nonsense because he's a billionaire. We need to like, we need to celebrate people who do things that are seemingly impossible, but give us a, a shared stake in a better future and more progress in the future. Uh, so I think that that's our culture problem right now is we don't have enough people I- explaining the change in a way that people can understand the opportunity behind that change. And we have too many people who are explaining stuff who are inheritors of broken institutions that have outlived their usefulness. And so we need different types of leaders with a different type of vision about what it takes to make things happen in the future. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm optimistic we'll get there, but it's not going to just work itself out. We need people to make an unapologetic case for that better future. Uh, we, we don't have enough of those right now.
how much can technology play a role in reshaping and fixing these institutions that are not, you know, technology first institutions? Well, I don't think te- uh, technology in general, I'm a fan of it, right? But like technology just allows people to organize and create in different ways that weren't possible, right, before. So like, it, like for example, the printing press and double entry counting way back when, there was like the 30 years war is an outgrowth of the printing press. And so the, there will be dislocation. But ultimately, I think with the sweep of history and looking back on it, I think it was an unambiguously good thing for the printing press to exist, right? I think double entry counting, unambiguously good thing. Mass production, mass distribution, unambiguously good overall. When I think about mass computation, mass connectivity, I believe we have the opportunity to create micro sovereignties that operate not physically bound to a location, but operate in the cloud. And so now you have these cloud societies Uh, that can make things happen together. And, you know, when you think about it, in some ways, Bitcoin is like an example of that, right? So Bitcoin is a society of people who believe in sound money. And their governance is uh, a protocol that makes it not in the interest of bad actors to have fraudulent transactions in the system. So I think that the solutions are going to come from more things like that. It's going to be decentralized networks that come together and are organized with common interests and a clear governance uh, model. And I think that a lot of the networks of the future that are gonna win and be valuable, that in some ways they're gonna be like a micro sovereignty in the sense that, you know, what is a country really? It's a set of people that have a common constitution, governance. It's like we're a club. We, in theory, we're supposed to say who's allowed in the club, like who could immigrate, can't seem to agree on that. But in theory, we should have an immigration policy. We should, we should have a constitution that exists to protect the rights of individuals. And we should also have laws and law enforcement that make it not in the interest of somebody to say, I'm gonna go Mad Max Rogue and subjugate a bunch of people because you know, laissez-faire everything goes is not the same as protecting people's rights. So what I'm seeing in these networks is the same kind of philosophy. It's not, I make widgets to sell you. It's like, join my uh, society And all of us play a role, and this gets back to the wealth of networks as well. All of us play a role in creating value in the society, not just the center. They're, you know, user-generated content, ride sharing, uh, all this, you know, you have the you have a co-creation and co -co co-production and co-consumption. But I think that the networks that are gonna win in the future also have a governance model that disincentivizes bad actors and that makes the society worthwhile for the honest participants who want to contribute value and you get paid when you give the network what it wants. And that's, you know, that's kind of what happens. So Bitcoin is a, is a great example of a micro sovereignty, but let me, let me push back on that. Let me play devil's advocate. So what happens when the people with guns say that we don't like this micro sovereignty? Because I think that a lot of people would ask that. I mean, I think a lot of people that, that don't know much about Bitcoin, and I, I don't know much either. I, I think I know more than the average person, but I, I don't know that I can answer this intelligently, is what happens when the people with guns say, okay, that's cute. You're, you're a little thing in the cloud. We're going to shut it down and we have the guns and therefore we win. And, and you know, that very well may happen, right? Just like the 30 years war happened. Uh, but um the, the, the way I see it is that um, an- another reason for the nation state is, you know, governments are basically granted a monopoly on violence. And in theory, they're granted that monopoly on violence to protect the rights of their citizens. And um, but like a nation state versus a city state or whatever, that's also evolved through history. Right. You had city states uh, back in the day and you had feudal societies back in the day. And a lot of people argue that the size of those societies, the unit of interest is a function of the efficiency of being able to monopolize violence. So right in the last 200 years, big nation states became more efficient in the use of violence than tiny little city states, right? If you're a tiny little city state, you can't have a big army. You can't can't have anywhere near near the scale of of a armed forces that say the United States has. But in a world where um, the action is increasingly at the edges, 
and where the network can create the protocol that allows people to voluntary, voluntarily interact, those values are closer to the original constitution and the, kind of the philosopher kings of, of human rights than the laws and the, the institutions that we have today. And so there will be attempts by institutions that are trying to perpetuate themselves to outlaw these things, to uh, subvert them, whatever. But I think in the end, it's inevitable. And the, the question is just how long it will take and what will the resistance look like? And then to me, the, the interesting question becomes, is the nation state the, the primary uh, entity of uh, unit of citizenship? Some people would argue we're gonna have a global economy, although there's been a lot of pushback on that. We're gonna have one global society. Some people say, no, the opposite's true. We're gonna have a bunch of micro societies that people can opt in and out of. And, um, you know, it reminds me of this book, Exit, Voice and Loyalty, which was written 50 years ago. You know, you can, you can be loyal to, to the, the sovereignty you're at. You can leave if you want, take your business elsewhere, or you can uh, use your voice to try to get it to, to, so like I look at it in the state of California right now, I try to use voice because I'm not blindly patriotic to California, but I believe it has enough potential and value to try to help it or try to raise your voice about what could be better about it. So um, I think that's gonna happen with these little networks and some of them will be really large, some of them won't be so large, but I think that it's gonna shift power uh, uh, from the from the nation states as we know them today. You have talked about beer businesses and then wine and wine and cheese businesses, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I call it beer, beer slammer versus wine sipper. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that's actually a great metaphor for how ideas are also perceived because the conversation that we're having right now, I, I do think that probably a good amount of people who, you know, I'm, I'm from Ohio, right? So it's in the heart of the Rust Belt. I, when I lived in San Francisco, I, I actually had people ask me like, what, what is Ohio like? Like, are there actually rusted out factories? And, uh, and the answer is yes, right? And so a lot of people from that region and, and from other regions across the country that uh, were, were more manufacturing centered that are kind of looking around saying, what, what is the future here? You know, I, I think that the answer may be a lot of what, what you're talking about in the optimism. I, I do wonder how the benefits, and I'm all in on the benefits of, of the micro sovereignties, as you call them. But I think that uh, when you talk about in practice, you know, how do these things get implemented at a large scale? How do you how do you kind of like bridge the network? Because I do think the first adopters will be the the wine uh, connoisseurs, whereas the beer connoisseurs. Are, Will, will be later to the party. And as everything we just talked about, um, whether that is the monopoly on violence, whether that is uh, simply voting, I do think there will be a resistance depending upon how these things are positioned. And I know this is really abstract. Um, yeah, so, so you know what's interesting about that? Um, so Jeff, I think that, you know, I, I read these articles about people from Silicon Valley going into the red states and talking to people who voted for Trump. And they write these stories almost like they're uh, watching a zoo animal in its habitat, right? Like they're observing this, this less sophisticated creature than they are. And, and then they ask these people, don't you think it would be good to have universal basic income? Think about how arrogant that premise is. Like, hey, I'm coming to visit you because you're too stupid to be able to make a living on your own. And so how about this, universal basic income? Would that cause you to not hate me for being such a rich techie? And like, I was raised in Oklahoma. The people that I know in Oklahoma, their, their goals in life is not for their kids to have better welfare, right? But they also don't want to be talked down to, right? Because they believe in sort of this Judeo-Christian ethic of, you know, America's a land of dreamers and that you can make your own life and destiny. If you work hard, you're going to succeed. But what we need to do a better job of at Silicon Valley and places that are benefiting from tech is to say, look, I may not be able to save your manufacturing job if you're 50 years old. I may not be able to do that. It may be displaced the way farming was. But like if, if you'd been a farmer in 1900, and you weren't telling your kid, learn how to read, 
you were you were not being a good parent. You you were not uh, uh, embracing reality, and you were not setting your kids up for success and achieving the American dream. And the reality is, right? There's a new kind of literacy we need. We need um, first of all, we need, we need an ethos that's not what happened in the late 1900s, which is um, organization man, cog in the machine. Uh, if I do, if I follow all the rules, I'll get promoted. I'll get my pension in K to 12 class. If I tell the teacher the answers they want to hear, I'll get a good grade. Like that doesn't work anymore. That works for a mass production, uh, big industry, big institution economy. What works in today's world, it, it's it, the idea that robots are going to eat the jobs is precisely wrong. Software is going to eliminate the need for most people to need to work in companies. And it's going to give people the infrastructure, the superpowers to make life on their own terms. And we need to help educate um, our, our folks, our young people, that that's a good thing. And that, um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, if, if the 20th century was about business planning and micromanagement, the, the 21st century is about thinking in bets. So we need to like help our, help our young folks understand about risk taking and how to think about that correctly and how to think about compound interest and how to think about how coding is the new literacy, all of these things. And, and we need to quit pretending that's not the reality, right? Like we, we, we act as if, oh gosh, you're telling people to code, you, you know, you're being provincial and biased. No, if you, if you told somebody, no, you don't have to learn to read in 1900, you weren't doing them any favors. And so like, I think that, that we need to approach people through the lens of opportunity and reality, right? There's no, there's no free lunch, but what's on the other side is really good. But it's just like, you have to take agency for your life. And I, you know, if you can't take agency for your life, there's not, not much anybody can do because then your goal is better welfare. I, I totally agree with that in terms of, I mean, I, to your very first point uh, on that, that segment is, you know, when I was in San Francisco, I, I went back, uh, the Cleveland Indians were in the world series right before the election. And I went back to uh, go to the world series and my uh, where I'm from, the zip code where I'm from actually was ranked as like one of the most competitive uh, zip codes in the country by the wall street journal. And it never fails that whoever has the most signs, presidential signs in the yard uh, around my, my neighborhood uh, and surrounding area always is the best predictor. And I remember I went back to San Francisco and I was telling some people uh, at the office, I said, Trump's going to win. And they're like, you're, you're absolutely crazy. You're, you're just, you're nuts. And I'm like, no, I mean, that's the, that's the only data point I need. Like he's going to win. And sure enough, he won. And there was kind of this lack of uh, reconciliation and, and search of why that could be. And now longtime listeners know that I'm not, uh, I'm not, not critical uh, of, of President Trump's record, as I think most people are, uh, especially his temperament. But that being said, that has nothing to do with the actual voters. And, you know, I think this totally ties into what you just got at of what are we teaching our children, because what we teach our children is what they're going to think about when they're an adult, right? And that's the framework they're going to use to, to view the world. And so whether that is uh, a sense of agency on the cultural side, the the work, the Judeo-Christian work ethic that you just talked about, or, you know, the skills of the 21st century to learn how to code, that is absolutely something that we should be doing in uh, across the country to be able to kind of level the playing field. I mean, one thing that I think about is I don't, I don't understand from an abstract level, like why, I, I guess I do understand the practicalities of it, but, but an abstract level, why do we advance children through the grade ranks when they're below grade level, right? So it's like, oh, well, these kids are at third grade level of reading. Well, then why are they in eighth grade? Why don't we do everything we can to uh, have them do extra schooling or whatever it is? The answer, in my opinion, is it comes down to the family um, that really solves that. Uh, but that that's different. Um, you know, we talked about debt earlier too. the, the CBO actually issued this report recently that, uh, the expected income, uh, across the uh, expected average income, uh, across the spectrum for, for median, median income from Americans is, is supposed to be $6,300 lower, uh, over 30 years. So, or in 30 years. And, and so uh, that is not that is not a an optimistic picture. Um, 
whether you're looking at it from the macro level in that sense or the micro level of, of what we're teaching the kids. Yeah, I'm skeptical of a lot of that. But like, here's the, here's the other thing though, Jeff, I think that it's important. Like a lot of people say, okay, what would you say to the person in Dayton, Ohio, right? Who lost their job or, you know, how do you, how do you help people who um, honestly want to get ahead in this world, but don't have the skills or the, the way to compete? But like what people don't realize in my view is that Silicon Valley types are at least as big of a part of the problem because Silicon Valley types tend to believe that Trump won because all of his voters are backward. They tend to believe that Trump, they tend to believe that when they want to uh, quote unquote hear about why Trump won, they're really listening for the stuff they're ignorant about. So they can better understand how to say things that would resonate to counter their ignorance. Now, I didn't vote for Trump, right? Like, I, like he's not my guy at all. But like the, the, the revolt of the public, that book exp- has much more explanatory power for why Trump won than, right. oh gosh, we've got a bunch of ignorant people here who are falling behind and ignorant and racist and all this stuff. You know, you, you can't possibly vote for Trump and not be one of those kind of people. Like people who say that are also bigots. They're just a different kind of bigot. And that's one of the problems that, that I've had in living with Silicon Valley is a lot of people around me are bigots, but they're like too self-assured in their intellect to know it. And so like, and, and for, for us to get ahead as a society, w- that kind of arrogance and that kind of arrogant worldview needs to go away because like we're never gonna have a shared stake if you think that the people you have a shared stake with are inferior to you or are, you know, anytime they disagree with you, it's because of some flaw in their character or some flaw in their intellect. It's simply not true. And so like, uh, you know, it's amazing to me living in Silicon Valley, nobody learned a darn thing about why Trump won. You know, it was, it, it was, okay, we got to resist. we got to get him out of here. You know, they, the Russians did it. They caused him to steal the election. Like there was, there was no introspection at all. Uh, and, and that's really sad because that is another form of failed leadership. That is another form of uh, refusing to look ahead and to how we can all have a stake. Uh, and, I, and people don't even see themselves doing it. They're so, they're so convinced. It's like an operating system of their mind. They, can, they can't even, it doesn't even compute that it could be any other way. Radical open-mindedness is absolutely something I strive for personally. Like if I, if I figure out that I'm wrong, all the better. Yeah. I do think that's missing. Can you, can you imagine a, uh, a, 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 you know, public school curriculum where, uh, you know, in one class you're talking about question everything, always ask what the why is, understand the background with a radical open-mindedness. And then the next, the next class you're talking about uh, expected value uh, as he's talking about thinking in bets, that really uh, inspires me. And I, I, I think that that's, uh, that is a great vision for the future. I think it's just a matter of, of getting it done. And Yeah, and knowing that it's an important question, right? Like knowing that we're making a choice and, and, and knowing that you can have agency as a person in helping us as a people, you know, make better choices about our future and have it be more glass half full, optimism, make the pie bigger rather than pessimism, learned helplessness, nihilism, fight the other guy for a bigger slice of the pie. Cause I don't think the pie can get bigger, can only get smaller, but it's like, you know, especially anybody who's young listening to this, uh, like you have a choice about what you want your life to be about. And, um, you know, right now what we need is the equivalent of the greatest generation. Like in the 20th century, my grandfather went through the depression, fought in World War II. And like those people really showed up when it was, when it was go time, right? When it was like the world could have ended up in a very different place. That's what we need today. We need, you know, I call it breakthrough generation, but we need a set of people who say, you know what? Breakthroughs are possible. I can make it happen. That goal is important. Let's go. Right. And, um, and we need more unapologetic voices that arm those people with the language of optimism so they don't submit to all this chattering nonsense around them about this woke nihilism that is just it's just a path to nowhere it's just a path to learn helplessness it is it's also 
not really rooted in reality. I mean, I think if you study history, it, it, it falls apart pretty, uh, pretty quickly. I might have to title this episode, Mike Maple's American Optimist. Uh, okay. I, I, I think, uh, I, I think you, you have me actually feeling optimistic, even though we've talked about a lot of the problems in society, because uh, I think that there is uh, a new frontier, if you will. And this is why guys like Suarez are so inspiring to me, because this guy shows up out of nowhere against a backdrop of tribal, you know, anger and everybody saying who else's fault it is. And he says three simple words. How can I help? And he launches an entire way of thinking about the role of government. It's kind of amazing that it seems controversial. It's kind of amazing that it seems innovative that a mayor would say, how can I help? And say, hey, let's glass half full. Let's make things happen. Let's play offense. That's He's the exact type of leader. He is a 21st century mayor uh, personified in my view. Now, we, we didn't, I, I totally agree. We didn't really get into the media but I was pretty, I was pretty animated when I listened to a, a New York Times podcast with him being interviewed because the entirety of the interview, and, and quite frankly, this is why I started this podcast. Uh, not that I have anything that special to say or any uh, elevated interview skills. I just, I was so sick of this type of interview that they did. And they had, as you just alluded to, one of the most energetic, optimistic, futuristic, mayors in the country that we've seen in a really long time. It was starting a movement with three words. And the only thing they talked about was, well, you're a Republican and you didn't like Trump. And, you know, here's another question about how, you know, you're being floated for vice president. And it's just like the typical headline grabbing stuff you have. And, and, the, and the other thing that, that, that really gets it's at so me. Stupid. It- it's just like, it's like nihilism <laughs> has MAGA right, but it also has MAGA left. You yeah. know, it's got like, you know, the people who want the unions to be really powerful again, the people, you know, there's Trump's wants to go into the past, but so does AOC. They they just have a different flavor of MAGA, but like those people are part of the nihilistic tear it down types. And, and talking about them as the central subject is wrongheaded. It's, it's not the conversation we need to be having in this world right now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. With, with mayor Suarez, the, the, the story is, uh, how are you building a, a futuristic city in Miami and how can other cities replicate that? And from yeah. there, it creates a ripple effect and other mayors see it, other governors see it, and they, they want to replicate it. I think that's exactly what you got to do. Um, all right. Well, I know that we're, uh, we're pressing up on our time here. Any, any closing thoughts or anything else you, you would like to discuss? No, I think we mostly covered it. I just think that we're at, we're at a very profound time in our history uh, in the Western world. And uh, if you're out there wondering what's going on, the, the truth of the matter is you can make a difference. You can take agency in your life. You can change the future. Uh, and the people that are telling you otherwise have an agenda. And their agenda is, is an agenda of clinging to power by convincing people to engage in learned helplessness. And uh, they're on the wrong side of history, no matter how powerful they are, no matter what uh, arguments they win or lose or whatever, they're on the wrong side of history. And like, we need more people, especially young folks to sit, to decide to be on the right side of history and to remember like what got the Western world to where it is and to unapologetically move it forward the way, you know, I want to see people look back on these times like they look back on 1870 with Cornelius Vanderbilt. I want people to be like, man, it's like, can you imagine there was a world where people died of cancer? Can you imagine there was a world where people had diabetes or like, can you imagine there was a world where people couldn't predict a disease they were going to get years in advance? Like people had to live with that stuff in the 2020, right? right? And it's like, that's, that's the kind of world we need to create. And that's what we need to get back to is like, you know, every problem has a solution and the art, the, the march of history is been consistently positive. So be part of it, be part of the positive march of history rather than directionless and learned helpless. 
Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Great place to end. All right. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate Thanks, it. Jeff. Yeah. Hope I didn't talk too much, but it was, it was fun. Didn't talk enough. <laughs> okay. All right. See ya. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thanks, Mike, for coming on. That was a blast. Uh, if this is the first time you're listening, please hit subscribe. And if you are a satisfied customer, please leave a written five-star review. And we will see you next week. Thank you.